So back in our auth.js file, we'll try to find the user by the email address. And if we can't find it, we're gonna throw a new authentication error. So it could either be very specific and say that email is incorrect, or we could be very generic and just say incorrect email or password. Please try again. In fact, we can go ahead and extract this into a constant. Let's call it message. And we'll pass in the message to the error constructor like this. And of course, we need to make this function asynchronous with the async keyword. And now once we have the user, we need to validate the password for that user. Now it'll be useful to add a helper method to the user model. So let's go back to user.js in our models. We already have a pre-save hook, which hashes the password before the model is saved. We're gonna add another method. So let's reference the user schema. In this case, it's going to be an instance method. So we're gonna reference methods property. So this one you're gonna be able to call on the actual user instance. So in this case, we could do something like user dot matches password. So this will be the name of the actual method. Now the difference between matches password and doesn't exist is that the doesn't exist method, it needs to be called on the model itself. So you could do user uppercase dot doesn't exist because it's a static method. But for an instance method, you can call it on the actual instance of the model, like the user that we found by the email address. So we're going to do lowercase user dot matches password and let's add that method. So it's going to be a function that accepts a password. Once again, it's going to be a traditional function and not an arrow function because we need to have access to the this keyword. So we're going to go ahead and return bcrypt dot compare. But of course, we can just import that method just as hash. So let's import compare. And now the first argument will be the password that we receive as an argument. So this is the password that was supplied as an argument to our query. And the second argument will be the actual hash. So this will be this dot password. This in this case will be the actual user model. So for example, the user that we find by the email address once again, and password once again is what we receive as the argument to the query. So now we can save this file. And now that we have a matches password function, we can go ahead and call it passing the password argument. But we also have to make sure to put a wait on it because it's asynchronous. And now if this operation fails, that means that the passwords don't match. So we can throw a new authentication error. Once again, we could be very specific and just say password incorrect. Or alternatively, we could also be very generic and once again pass the existing message, which is going to say incorrect email or password, please try again. And of course, we also need to import the user model from models. In fact, it's going to be on the same level because auth is going to be at the root of the source file. So from auth, we're going to go to models index.js and then to user.js to get the actual model. And finally, we're gonna return the user instance. So this will be the actual user model that we were able to find. And now if the authentication fails, so if the user with the given email address doesn't exist, we're gonna throw an error. And also if the passwords don't match, we will also throw an error with the same exact message. So now back in here, assuming that we get a user object, we're going to go ahead and reference the request session.userid. Once again, it doesn't have any special meaning. This will be a custom variable on the session. So we're gonna set a user ID and this one will equal user.id. So once this request is done, the session middleware will actually set a cookie on the response object. So this way the user will be able to access the resources on the server with that session ID cookie. So now for the sign out mutation, what we can do is we can check that the user is signed in because it doesn't make sense to sign out if you're not signed into the system. And now what we can do is we can, once again, either put all the logic in here, but because we already have the auth.js file with the helper method, we could add another function, let's call it sign out. So in this function, we're gonna do a request.session.destroy. This will accept an error callback. If there was an error, we could return back that error. But what I'm thinking instead is we're going to actually return a promise. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to wrap this function. Once again, it's gonna take a request and a response. The request is necessary because we need to access request.session, but the response is also needed because we want to clear out the cookie before the user signs out. So once again, I'm going to return a promise in this case, what we can do is we can have a callback function. So it's going to accept, resolve, and reject. And now inside of that function, we're going to paste in the call to session.destroy. And if the error occurs, we're going to simply reject the callback with that error. If we didn't have any error, we're going to call res clear cookie. 
Of course, we need to have access to session name. And this one, of course, we can import as well. So it's gonna come from the config file, which is at the same level. And then once the cookie is cleared out, we could do resolve with a Boolean set to true. So once we have this sign out function, let's also import it from here. So we're gonna delegate to that helper function. Let's return auth.signout. So we're gonna pass in the request as well as response. And if you remember, the response is gonna come from context as well. Once again, that's because we define the context as a function in here. So we get the request as well as response object. So now let's go back to our terminal. I'm gonna clear it out and I'm gonna try to do a yarn dev. So let's see if we made any mistakes. Seems like we forgot the me query. So let's go back and fix that. So in type definitions, I'm going to add another query. I'm gonna call it me. So this one is not gonna take any parameters, but it's going to return a user if you're signed in. Back in the terminal, we get the link to our server. So in the past, we were able to execute queries without being logged in. So now let's try to do a query to users. As you can see, we get an error, which says you must be signed in. That's because of the helper function that we've set up for the user's query. So it's going to first check if you're signed into the system before you can access any of the resources on the server. And the same thing is, of course, going to apply to the me query. So this one is a helper query to get the information about the currently signed in user. So now if I try it, of course, I'm going to get an error because we're not signed into the system yet. So because I know we don't have any users in the application, let's go ahead and try to do a mutation. We're going to call the sign up mutation. We'll pass an email. I'll quickly fill it out. So we'll get an ID, email, username, and name. So this will create a user. We also expect it to create a session ID cookie. Now, if I look at the cookies using the edit this cookie extension, you're going to see that the cookie is not found there. And this is because we forgot to add a statement to set the user ID on the session once we create the user. So the exact same one that we do in the sign in mutation, once we validate the user's credentials, we're going to want to copy that statement and also put it over here. So before we even return the user, we're actually going to put it into a constant. So we're going to do an await on user.create and once we get the user we're going to set that user id on the session and finally we're going to return back the user object itself and you're going to see that we still don't get the cookie and that's because the graphql playground does not allow cookies by default so what we need to do to enable cookies is we need to change the request credentials setting from omit to include like this. But the downside with this approach is it's actually only going to work as long as you have the settings saved in your current browser session. So if you clear out the history and local storage from your browser, of course, all of these settings will also get cleared. So it's a lot easier to set them up on the server. And if you have all of the dependencies up to date, now specifically, I'm talking about the Apollo server dependency. So if your Apollo server is a 2.2.2, .2 .2, which is currently the latest one, you can go back to your index.js file. Now what we can do here is we can provide a configuration for the playground. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna check if we are in production. So if the node environment is set to production, we're gonna pass back a value of false. So this is going to completely disable the playground. Otherwise, we're gonna pass a configuration object. We're gonna pass a settings property. And once again, in this case, we're gonna reference the request.credentials property. So let's put it in and we're gonna set it to include like this. So this will in fact include the cookies as a response from the server. And on the same note, let's actually go ahead and also disable any course requests. So I'll set course to false. Now what this is gonna do is it's going to limit the request to the server only to the current domain. So in this case, it's only going to be localhost 3000, like this. So if you're gonna try to send a query from localhost 4000, for example, on the front end, it's actually going to fail because of the missing course headers from the server. Now, once we start working on the front end part, I'm gonna show you how you can mitigate this issue. But for the time being, we're gonna put a maximum security and we're gonna set the course headers to false. So only if you're on the same domain can you actually query the server. So we're gonna save this file. So let me go back in here. I'm gonna do it one last time. So let's do max15. And once we run it, let's make sure we get back the cookie. And as I can see in this case, we actually get a session ID cookie. And this one of course will contain the ID of the session. And you can see that this cookie is going to also expire in two hours. Now to prove that the session was actually created, I'm gonna go back to the terminal. Let me open a new tab. And because I already have the Redis client installed using Redis tools, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna execute the Redis CLI command. So let's actually do dash dash help. 
In this case, we can pass a few arguments. So for example, we can supply a host as well as port and also a password. So let's do exactly that. So I'm going to do Redis CLI with a host pointing back to Redis Labs. I also pass a port and my password. So once I'm in, if I do scan zero, you're going to see that we get one object. Its key is session colon the session ID. So if we copy the name and if we do get on that key, you're going to see that we get a JSON object. In this case, we get the cookie with the cookie information. In this case, we're going to get the maximum age of two hours. We get the expiry date. In this case, the time is 940 because it's in GMT, but we also see that it's not secure. It's HTTP only. We get the path, the same site attribute, and we also get the actual user ID. So if you compare that user ID to the actual ID of the user, you're going to see that the two match. So if we go back over here, that's the exact same user ID that we get from the application. And on the same note, you're going to see that this ID after sess column, this one of course matches the actual session ID. So if we once again look at the value stored in the cookie, you're going to see that it's a string. Once again, we can ignore the first part, which is s colon URL encoded, but the next part before a period, so before the actual signature, this one will be the same exact session ID. So once again, the session ID is going to equal the same exact value that is stored in the Redis as a key to that session. You can see that the two values match. So this is how these sessions are stored. So now having the session ID cookie, we can actually write a query with me. We could get the ID, the email, for example, and this will still work. And it's actually going to continue to work even after we restart the server. So for example, in the past, because we were using an in-memory store, the moment you would restart the server, all of these sessions would be cleared out. But because we store the sessions in Redis right now, if I restart the server, I should still be able to access my session information as long as the cookie is still valid. So before the cookie expires, I should still be able to fire off queries to the server and get the information I need. Now, of course, we already tested the signup mutation. It seems to work just fine. But imagine that I cleared out the cookie. So I'm going to clear out this cookie and I'm going to try to write another mutation. So in fact, let's try to write out a mutation to sign in. We'll pass an email as well as the password and we'll try to get back an ID, maybe also the name. So if we run it, you could see that we get back the user object and this should also create a session ID cookie. And as you can see, it does. But if it clear it out and I try, let's say wrong email, this will fail because we can't find the user with that email. And if I pass a wrong password, this will also fail because the passwords won't match. And in this case, of course, we won't get the session ID cookie. Once again, I'll try to log in. We get back the user object and we also get logged in. Now, if I create a new mutation, let's try to sign out. And if we run it like this, you see that we get true. And you will also find out that the cookie also gets deleted. Now, if we try to sign out once again, of course, this will fail because we have to be logged in to the system. But on the contrast, the sign-in mutation is actually idempotent. And that's because we can fire off the same mutation multiple times. It only creates a cookie once, and we're going to see it in this window using the edit this cookie extension. But once again, we can run the same mutation multiple times. It's just going to return back the same exact user object. But for other methods like sign out, we want to first make sure that we signed in. And of course, for the sign up mutation, we also want to make sure that we're signed out. Because if we are signed in, it doesn't make sense to create the user. So if you look at the schema for the user right now, it's already pretty solid. We have the sign up mutation. We can also sign into the app. And of course, we can sign out from the app. As far as getting the user by the ID, this might be useful later on in the front end. So I'm going to keep that query as well. So in the next video, we're actually going to move on to messages and chats. So we're actually going to start working on the communication portion in the app. But for the time being, this should suffice. So this has been Authentication and GraphQL. I hope you enjoyed the video. And I'm going to see you next time. Take care.